Good evening. Welcome to another edition of the Tom Murphy Show. Uh, in the past year as being mayor and before even running for uh, mayor, I heard a lot of concern and uh, justifiable concern by parents, people who live in the community, people who walk in the community, people, people who bike in the community, about safety going through our streets, about people driving too fast, people going through stop signs. And having grown up in the city of New York and having witnessed uh, traffic fatalities and accidents over the year, uh, I, I, I realized how important this is. And myself and the Board of Trustees are working on something called the Safe Streets Initiative to uh, try and calm traffic, get people to drive safer, and make our streets safer for everyone. Uh, that being said, two of the people who are instrumental in the Safe Streets Initiative, the first one is Matt Carmody, who's the regional project, who, no, I'm sorry, who uh, is a, an engineer with uh, AKRF, a very uh, famous consulting firm here in Westchester County. And the second is my friend Shannon Purdy. And Shannon is the regi regional project manager for the Department of Transportation. And we are lucky enough to have her on our uh, traffic commission. Absolutely. And she's been a, a great asset. And the, tra the traffic commission as a whole does great work. And we appreciate everything you guys do. Let me show you, Matt. Uh, you know, Reducing traffic congestion is a top priority in the village of Mamari. How do we pursue that goal in, a, in, a, in a, you know, first the low-hanging fruit and then the, uh, you know, the, the, the greater you know, benefits? Sure. Um, you know, it really depends on the context of the street when you're talking about traffic congestion or I think of things in terms of traffic safety also. So uh, a residential street, um, you know, shouldn't have a lot of cut-through traffic. You want to look at ways to reroute traffic um, to get it away from those residential streets. Obviously, you don't want them to be speeding. Um, and then for a busier street, you know, like Mamaroneck Avenue or Boston Post Road, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of traffic on those roads. Uh, those are, you know, the economic engines of the village. So it's inevitable that there's going to be parking problems, traffic problems, but you want people to also be able to walk around those roads too. So it's not a real problem if there's traffic congestion. That's a sign that business is good right. and that's a thriving village people want to live. But it's a bad thing if you can't cross the street or if you feel dangerous walking around. So you have to have some interventions for that. So, so we have to it's a, a share the road kind of idea, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the roads are not just for vehicles. You know, they're for people crossing the street. They're for people walking along the street. If there's no sidewalks, illegally, you can be in the road walking. It's for cyclists. It's for buses. It's for a lot of legal different users. Shannon, you facilitated a, uh, a walking assessment in the Rhinex session, uh, which I, I participated in, but you, you were really the leader. So could you just, what, what did we take away from there? Oh, well, <clears throat> I mean, that's just such a great example of bringing together the, the needed pieces of what we call the multidisciplinary team that helps make uh, an, a roadway environment safer for all users, as Matt was saying. Um, you know, oftentimes, we get lost in this notion that the streets are for vehicles and mm -hmm. cars. And instead, no, I mean, it really is shared public space that no matter what mode of transportation you pick, you should be able to get around efficiently, effectively, and safely without being hit. The walking safety assessment was literally taking the engineers and the law mm -hmm. enforcement and the policy makers and the residents who lived in that neighborhood, bringing them together and just going for a walk together and observing what the environment really was like and how safe they felt. Um, you know, as you know, we had a, a standardized checklist that we kind of used right. and recorded our observations in terms of were there sidewalks available? If I were someone who were disabled or um, if I needed to reach this transit stop, could I do so safely? Um, you know, and not just sort of the built environment, but some of the behaviors that we observed as well. Um, you know, the way that people travel in their cars, were they exceeding the speed limit? Um, were they stopping to yield f for pedestrians right. in the crosswalk? Things like that. You know, we, we, we have recently installed uh, in different areas, and there's going to be more, uh, those yellow uh, rectangular signs uh, that say, uh, that say uh, pedestrians have the right of way. Uh, but how do we get people to... You know, I, I think there's, there's an element of police enforcement, but there's also an element of, you know, just the entitlement of cars, right? That, that I'm driving, you know, you wait until I pass until you cross, but that's not the law and it's not the way we want to operate. I mean, how do we instill that into people that, you know, the pedestrian always has the right way? 
Yeah, I mean, the sign in itself is supposed to be educational because yeah. it says state law yield to pedestrians right. in the crosswalk. So, you know, if you can't read that or you want to ignore it, then you have to go farther, which is enforcement. Yes. So, you know, having the, uh, you know, the village police uh, and also the village residents and visitors and business people all have that shared understanding that this is New York's law. It's the vehicle and traffic law when you're in a marked crosswalk. Uh, even if you're not at a traffic signal, the pedestrian has the right of way. Right. And, you know, there are ways to uh, do warning programs um, to, uh, you know, give people fake tickets so that they're educated without being penalized. Um, and there are grants. Um, uh, Shannon's organization, I'm hoping she'll talk more about it in a second, uh, provides grant services to, like, the uh, village police department to be able to do these educational um, tours that don't cost the village more money. So as soon as I step off the sidewalk and I'm in that crosswalk, anybody coming in either direction should stop. Is that correct? Yeah, they should. I wouldn't count on it all no, the time. No, I wouldn't count on it. I would keep my eyes open. <laughs> yeah. But I'm just saying for, for the driving public, if you see somebody that has stepped off the, the, the curb onto a crosswalk, yeah. you're supposed to stop. Yeah, correct. if you're in the crosswalk, then the vehicle is supposed to yield to you. That's now, Shannon, how do I get some money for this? <laughs> <laughs> well, and in fact, uh, our agency gives o and oversees monies to each state's governor's highway safety program. Okay. Um, so it's not directly from the U.S. Okay. DOT. So I got to go to Cuomo. In New York, uh, the governor's traffic safety committee up in Albany um, is uh, manages the the state highway safety funds for, as Matt said, enforcement and education campaigns. And in fact, um, just a couple of years ago, New York State launched a, a new annual pedestrian safety campaign that's called C mm -hmm. Be Seen. Right, you gave um, me some of those materials. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. Terrific free resources out there to, to start your, your outreach and your, and your education to the community. And really, you know, I think Matt made a great point. It's not enough just to have a law in the books. And it's not enough just to send your law enforcement officers out there and start writing tickets. A campaign that's going to have broad, widespread acceptance by the community has got to be one that has a very lengthy education component. Right. Um, you know, and so you've already started this, Tom, by having you know some local earned media articles about the Safe Streets Initiative. You know, some sort of warnings out there that look, we're not trying to do this to beat up on you. Right. We're trying to do this to make it safer for your kids to walk, for your mother and father to get to their senior center activities. Right. You know. Um, so those kinds of things and taking advantage of the free resources that are out there are terrific. Um, you know, certainly offline we can, I, I can help direct you to how to apply for grants from the GTSC for the law enforcement department as well. Well, we have, we have a grant writer now, so if you could sure. meet with them, that, 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 that might be helpful. Uh, what kind of behaviors put pedestrians and cyclists at risk of being involved in a crash? I mean, if I'm a pedestrian, how do I mitigate the obvious you know, danger? Yeah, um, there's a lot of different ways, and it's a shared responsibility. Like Shannon said, the uh, campaign for pedestrian safety statewide is C, be seen. Mm -hmm. So that in indicates that there's a shared responsibility, that you shouldn't just be looking for pedestrians at a motorist, but you should be seen as a pedestrian also. So some of the guidance is, um, you know, make sure that you make eye contact with right. the driver before you're going to cross. I mean, as we said before, Although the law protects you, you know, there's no protection from people misunderstanding your intention. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so don't walk across the street distracted by your cell phone. You can't, um, you can't make eye contact if you're doing that. And if you're a pedestrian at night, you want to have, you know, some brighter clothing on. Um, you know, I know everybody likes to wear all black. But this isn't walking attire. <laughs> yeah, no. but I wouldn't recommend, you know, crossing Boston Post Road no. over to Harbor <laughs> Island Park right now, um, especially outside of a marked crosswalk. And those are the responsibilities of the pedestrian. The drivers, you know, they, they have even more responsibility because when they make a mistake, you know, it's like a, a two and a half ton mistake against a person and, you know, who's going to win that. So, the, you know, the driver needs to not be distracted again. Um, they need to make sure that they're paying attention and they need to not be speeding, you know, because yes. you can react much faster to somebody who's crossing the street if you're going 20 miles per mm -hmm. hour than you're going 40 miles per hour. And we had a conversation uh, a little while, the, the day we did the assessment, and you, talk, you told me about the difference between getting hit by a car 
a certain speed and another speed. Could you just elaborate on that? Yeah, um, the, the New York City Department of Transportation, uh, you've seen these ads driving around, um, does a really good job of educating people on this. Um, it's The statistics say that if you're a pedestrian and you're hit by a car at 20 miles per hour, you have a 90% chance of living. If you get hit by a car at 40 miles per hour, you have a 10% chance of living. 90% so, chance of dying. Yeah. 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 Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so. No, yeah. So that, that's, that's a pretty stark, you know, because when, when we're driving, you think, oh, I'm just going a little bit above the speed limit. But, you know, if the speed limit's 30 and you're going 40, it, you know, I, I taught all three of my children to uh, drive. And one of the things I always told them is that, you know, if you, you know, when, you, when you're driving by parked cars on a residential street, you don't know if there's a kid there. You know, so just, because you know, kids have a tendency to want to get to the stop sign quickly, right? So, right. But it's just, the, it, the quicker we drive, the less our reaction time is going to be, no matter how, you know, how great your reflexes are and things like that. Exactly. So you know, the, I think for us, what we need to do is educate our residents that you know, we've seen the enemy and it is us. You know, we, we, we're always rushing to the next appointment. To, you know, I'm late for this and I've got to pick up the kid. There's always a reason to rush. Right. But you know, I think you know, and I, what I say to my kids, which seems to be effective, is how would you feel if you hit a kid? Right. Because yeah. you were hurrying a little bit. I mean, you, you carry that for the rest of your life. Yeah. If you think about driving on a highway at 60 miles per hour, if you drive like 10 miles per hour faster, you, you're not even going to get there, you know, 10 minutes faster. Right. So think about driving across town on a five minute drive. Yeah. You drive 10 miles over the speed limit, you're only getting there a few seconds early. Exactly. Right. It's and, not and worth it. Right. It's not worth it. Uh, inadequate parking seems to be a big issue. How can we address that? Boy. Shannon? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, this is a, a multi pronged answer, I would think, because, you know, certainly one of the residual goals and a really good one of making uh, a village or a roadscape safer for all users is that you will actually encourage people to walk and bike more. Um, you know, by encouraging people to not rely on their cars maybe for that half a mile trip down the road to get a gallon of milk, mm -hmm. you know, or, hey, you know, I can actually walk into the village for dinner out with my family on a yeah. Friday night. Um, you know, that alone will certainly help al alleviate some of the parking issues. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think all too often uh, folks get hung up on this idea that if we take one parking space away, it's going to negatively impact a business or it's going to cause, you know, um, strife amongst mm -hmm. neighborhoods or things like that. There's lots of creative solutions where uh, you can take the parking, not necessarily right in front of the store, and, and yet, you know, if you make that space a little bit more welcoming for other modes, um, business actually increases. You know, it becomes a, a desirable place for people to be seen. So. You know, I work in a city, and when the city did the turning lanes and the bike lanes and the bike racks, my, my first reaction is, oh, God, it's so hard to get around here already, now they're taking away parking. But you know it works, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I, I, I didn't believe it was going to work, but it really works. That does. That does. You know, what can we do, Matt, uh, on the streets that are, you know, kind of thoroughfares, or maybe from Halstead to Boston Post Road, that where people uh, speed down? Is, is it worthwhile pursuing uh, speed humps on those streets? or? Yeah, uh, speed humps are for certain kinds of streets. Um, they are most effective at slowing speeds only around the speed hump. Right. So if you have a long straight street like Halstead Avenue that's very wide, um, it's really only going to be effective at slowing traffic right. right around that hump. But for a thoroughfare like that that's, that's so wide and so straight, you have to do more than just you know a few speed humps. It, it requires, um, you know, we did the walkability audit on that, and we saw a lot of different things that could sure. be improved. Um, one of the things we saw at uh, North Barry is that it's uh, made into an even wider intersection because where the stop bars are, where cars are meant to stop, mm -hmm. they're pulled way, way back, you know, much farther back than you would need if you were having, like, multiple 18-wheelers turn across that intersection all day long, which doesn't happen there. So, you know, things like tightening up an intersection, maybe um, shortening the crossing distance at some of those key places where pedestrians cross. If 
by putting in something that are called curb extensions. So oh, like a bump out? <clears throat> yeah, it's, a, it's called a corner bump out or a bulb out or a curb extension. It takes the sidewalk and it makes it into a bump out into the intersection, but only to the edge of the parking lane. So what that does for the pedestrians is it lessens the crossing distance. And what it does for motorists is it gives the appearance that the curbs are kind of closing in on so you. So you slow down Psychologically, naturally. it slows you down, but you're not going to hit the curbs because they're actually in the parking lane. So it does things for motorists to slow them down. You know, you only need to go the speed limit on Halstead Avenue. Right. Um, you shouldn't be going faster than that. And as a pedestrian, you should be able to cross the equivalent of, you know, one lane per direction instead of the parking lanes too. You know, right. it looks really wide open unless you have those kinds of um, improvements that narrow the street. Um, I remember one idea that Matt had that was a very low-hanging fruit was simply by painting a white line to define the travel lane. It's a one-lane road, but because of its width, it appears like you've yeah. got this freeway ahead of you, right? By painting that white line, I mean, you're going Off to, of again... the sidewalk, like, you mean in the parking area? Yeah, it's a, called a parking lane stripe. And it indicates the edge of the travel lane, but also where the parking lane is right. for the cars. Often um, a street with one wide travel lane with parking will not have any striping in between the curb and the center line, which divides the two directions of travel. But that is as simple as putting a white stripe, you know, to indicate where the travel lane is. Okay. And, you know, the travel lane only needs to be as wide as 10 to 11 feet. Right. What is best? Way, is that the most effective way of getting drivers to slow down, or are there other tools we should be looking at? It's got to be a combination of engineering tools, you know. So it's got to be paint. It's got to be certain signage. We don't want to have something called sign pollution, where we have, you know, the pedestrian yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk, and then all these different signs. Um, but you also have to have education, you know, which Shannon yep. specializes in, in enforcement. And what's important is when you implement the engineering improvements is that you have some education leading up to that and then you have some enforcement right after it's implemented. So that engineering, enforcement, education is what we call the 3E approach to safety. Yeah. Which is absolutely critical in pedestrian and bicycle safety and, and that it's sculpted to meet the needs of the community just like we tried to do with, with our Halstead Avenue, North Berry Avenue yeah. assessment. Um, you know, look, pedestrian safety is not going to be the same in the village of Mamaroneck as it is in the South Bronx or as it is in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, we necessarily have to take not just the, the sort of infrastructure and education and, and outreach needs into consideration, but who lives here and what's important to them and how are these kind of activities going to impact them. And, you know, I mean, just looking at the little piece that we did on Halstead and North Berry, it's a very family-oriented community. Yes, it is. Lots of children, you know. Um, and people and want their children to be able to walk, exactly, and they want their children exactly. to be able to walk to school, right. and walk to the village. Yeah. I think that's part of the, the the allure of moving up here. Absolutely. I mean, that's you know, I came up from the city because I could walk. Yeah. Yep. You know, it, it's an attractive. It makes us, uh, you know, a desirable place to live. Good schools and walkability and trains. Yeah. So keep inviting, and certainly in my role on the Traffic Commission, I will as well, the residents to have a lot of feedback and input into this process. What about public bikes? I think they're terrific, but... <laughs> yeah, the, the county, several municipalities in Westchester County have already done agreements with something called Lime Bike. Yeah. Right. And uh, Lime Bike has uh, several advantages. One is that it's dockless, so unlike City Bike in New York City, you can park a Lime bike, you know, on any public sidewalk or public plaza. You don't have to have that infrastructure where it plugs into a dock. Um, the other advantage is that they share the data with the municipalities um, that they contract with. So Mamaroneck would learn where are people using these bike share bikes in our village. And then you could take that data and then use it to prioritize um, bicycle infrastructure you know, like bike lanes or even shared lane markings, which indicate a bike route. Right. So um, those are two advantages of it. And Lime Green supplies the bikes, and they, do they pay a franchise fee, or is it just a, right now an agreement to allow them to use? I believe in White Plains it was a pilot agreement, um, you know, but, but I think that they've migrated into a more permanent oh, state at this point. Okay. But, yeah, Lime Bike absolutely takes care of the maintenance and upkeep and everything like okay, that. Okay, that's good. 
That's kind of, I mean, I'd, I'd like to try that. Maybe uh, that would be a tri-municipal uh, between Largemont and uh, Village of Mamaroneck. Sure. Yeah, I think they've had multiple um, municipal agreements because they're in parts of uh, Greenberg and Yonkers, Yonkers. and White Plains. Yep. So. They're in Yonkers, too? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, well, this is interesting. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up on that. <laughs> I was, was going to task one of you with that. No, that's <laughs> my job. I'm sorry. <laughs> What are other engineering improvements that we could use uh, that, that, you know, I know, you know, sooner or later we're going to have to spend real money. Yeah, um, you know, some of the things that I mentioned, um, curb extensions, uh, those are real money. Um, they get very complicated, especially if you have uh, what's called a stormwater catch basin, you know, the drains on the street. Um, relocating them for a curb extension is uh, time consuming and requires additional approvals. That would, that would be more on the high side of things. Um, but some of the wide avenues um, in, in the village um, could have sort of medium cost improvements that, that don't require you disturbing the ground beneath, which is where you get very expensive. So I would say a medium cost improvement would be, it's called a pedestrian refuge island. So it's really um, just a concrete island that is in the middle of the street where the direction of travel is separated around it, it would kind of be in the locations where you see the state law yield to pedestrians and crosswalks. And, and that would uh, have a traffic calming effect too, because it's a... Yeah, it, it does because um, it gives pedestrians a refuge while they're crossing the street yeah. to be able to cross it in two steps instead of one. It gives you somewhere to wait um, for cars to go by you. It also um, provides a cue to motorists similar to a corner bulb out or a curb extension is that my travel lane is narrowing. I need to slow down yeah, and pay right. attention. And you naturally do that, right? I mean, it, it's, it's kind of uh, a yeah. human reaction when you see a constriction ahead. Yeah, it's a psychological thing. You know, tests have been done so that, you know, we engineers have that backup to say, we know it's going to work on most people because most people are going to slow down when they see a big curb raised up out of right. the road in the center of the road. Right. Now, the village uh, next year, uh, we've contracted out, or we're going to contract out to do about, uh, I forget the final number, it was $3.4 million worth of paving. Paving hadn't been done in a long time, and we, we're kind of trying to catch up. What I'd like you to do is, you know, look at the streets and tell me if any of them, while, while, while we're paving them, would be, you know, a good spot for a speed hump or, uh, you know, one of these. Now, I'll have Dan... Uh, get you that information. Yeah, um, repaving is a great time to reassess the yeah. striping on the road. So um, if you're going to come in with a paving contractor, you know, they're just going to replace what they see. Yeah. But if you have some interaction with them beforehand, it doesn't take, you know, no. engineering stamp to drawings. It just takes a little bit of coordination to say, look, when you repave and you put down these stripes, you're going to make them a little narrower for the motorist. Yeah. That's going to make it safer for the motorist. Well, you put down a parking stripe like you talked about. Yeah, you can yep. put a parking lane stripe. Um, you know, on certain roads with a little more planning, if there is enough room, you can stripe a bike lane if that makes sense. Um, with those kinds of things, you want to have community buy-in first. Um, but it's really not a big deal because it's paint that the contractor is already putting down and they have a per mile fee and it's no additional cost. You just have to talk to them beforehand and get them some specs, and then they do it. Okay. But if you don't get there early enough, they're just going to replace what they see. Right. I got to right. make sure you're involved right. in that situation. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to. Uh, what are the biggest challenges that we face? Yeah, I think of you know myself as an engineer who's a private consultant. I have my challenges, and then my clients, you know, a municipality like the Marinette has other challenges. So I think. Really, the shared challenges that we have are that, you know, changing people's minds, you know, yeah. getting the political will to do things that, in the end, is going to be safer for everybody. Yes. But you have to educate people Absolutely. on the benefits of it so that you can get consensus. Um, and then funding, you know, Shannon yeah. mentioned some grant funding, but there's also grant funding for the construction and design of things. So. Yeah. No, you know, I mean, Matt and I had uh, the equal opportunity recently to be at the Vision Zero Cities conference in the city. Um, you know, and I think, I think he nailed something important here, and it is changing the narrative mm -hmm. away from the feeling that the car has the ownership and has the priority. We've become such a car-centric, and 
look, you know, in, in the 50s when, you know, the dream was to be out on the yeah. open road with your hair in the breeze, uh, how often can you get your hair even in the, yeah. a breeze at all in Mimarnak, yes. right, because you're stuck in traffic? Yeah. It's the reality is that congestion and crashes and, and traffic violence cause more harm than they do good. And I'm not saying this to demonize people from driving. It's just a matter of switching that narrative to make folks accept and celebrate the fact that the streets belong to all of us. You know? And at the end of the day, all accidents are avoidable. That's right. And that's why my agency refers to them as crashes. And crashes, yep. exactly. Right. Right. 94% of all collisions are caused by human error. Yes. Yeah. If you say accident, it implies that nobody's at fault. Right. right. So we stop saying that. Right. Um, so I just I want the, the people of the community to know that this is something that we're going to be working on. It's a long-term plan. Sure. You know, this isn't a flash in the pan. This is going to be going on for years to try and make our streets safer. And at the end of the day, there is going to have to be some financial resources put into this. But it's about keeping our children safe. It's about keeping our community safe. And, it, and it's about making it a more livable community. Absolutely. So, you know, this is, this is a good use of taxpayer funding. You know, and when it's successful, you can't really quantify it because, you know, you, you, know, you don't know how many people you've saved. Right. Right. But I, I'm, I'm sure that this is a good investment. I want to thank both of you for being here for tonight. Matt, thank you for coming. You know, I, I know you're, you're, you're helping us out mm -hmm. on a professional basis, and I appreciate that. Shannon, thank you so much for volunteering your time for it's the community. So much fun. It, 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 <laughs> but it's, it's been an amazing resource for us to have uh, you know, at, as both an elected official and I know on the Board of Traffic Commissioners, you know, you, Absolutely. who actually do a great job, and they have a lot of dedicated folks there. We do. So until the next time, uh, that you'll be watching this probably right around the Thanksgiving time. And I want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, the holiday seasons are upon us. Please drive safely, uh, but please really enjoy your time with your family. At the end of the day, that's really all that's important. Thank you all. Have a good night, and we'll see you for the Christmas show. Thank you.